Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, After Effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media downloads, go to pond5.com slash frame rate. Pancakes, making bacon pancakes. Take some bacon and I'll put it in a pancake. Bacon pancakes, that's what it's gonna make. Bacon pancakes. Bacon pancakes, making bacon pancakes. Take some bacon and I'll put it in a pancake. Bacon pancakes, that's what it's gonna make. Bacon pancakes. Or from Arate, depending on where you're from. I'm Tom Merritt. Welcome to Frame Rate, episode 103. Hey, man, I'm Brian Brushwood, and you know who that was? That was Jake of Finn and Jake fame of Adventure Show fame. Wait, Adventure, Adventure Time. time. Yeah. yeah, no, that's it's almost like I messed this up for the second week in a row. Hey, man, how you doing, Tom Merritt? You know, I'm, I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. Uh, I, I was dancing around, because you can't help dancing around listening to Bacon Pancakes mash up like that. Were you dancing that's around? I couldn't see because you were playing it. Yes, correct. You well, I was I was dancing. I'm not going to lie. Thanks were, for you, outing me, Tom. About, now the well, whole I, world knows Brian Brushwood dances to bacon pancakes. Well, you know, I, I was, I, nobody could see it, but I was dancing around. But you know who else was dancing around? Our guest for today's show, Jeff Kanata, uh, contributor for Always On with Mollywood on CNET. Uh, I saw you bob- bobbing your head to that, too. How can you not? Exactly. Uh, I love the song with my whole heart. Although I have to say, the mashup is nice, but I prefer the song the way it's meant to be seen, which is on YouTube in the 10-hour version. <laughs> I've definitely seen the 10-hour version of Which has song. over 500,000 views on YouTube of the 10-hour Bacon Pancakes version. Coming yeah, to man, get this, you, one, this, one, the, this remix only had 800,000 views, so I thought that was pretty amazing. Yeah, that was, uh, it, it's a, uh, well, it, it's good in all of its forms, that song. As Indeed. are bacon pancakes, good in all of Yes, forms. they uh, are good. Jeff, thanks for joining us today, man. It's good to have you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Love the show, and I'm uh, happy to be here. We are going to start off with the big story. This just in, the big story. I think we're getting to about one Xbox rumor a week now. Uh, you That's know, good. As we can- that, means, that means we're about to have a breakthrough. It's yeah. like you've got to get up to it's it's like a geometric progression to a half life where it's like all of a sudden when you get right about to a rumor every 35 seconds, that means within the next week, a new Xbox appears. So the faster we can speculate, the faster we'll have a new Xbox. Uh, did you yeah, just I, confirm a new half life on the new Xbox? I think I think he did. Yes. Yeah, half life three coming out for the Xbox. <laughs> I'm thrilled that, that it's finally uh, happening. According to The Verge, Microsoft building an Xbox set-top box that would be a cheaper Xbox with a separate SKU, so an entirely, you know, not like an Xbox 360 without the hard drive inside, but still an Xbox 360. It would be a whole different product, but it would run the Xbox platform with casual games only. So you wouldn't be able to buy Half-Life uh, for it. Uh, you'd be able to play Angry Birds and stuff like that, but it would be devoted to being an entertainment center. So it would be the cheap box that you buy to hook up to your televisions to get Netflix, uh, to get Hulu, play a few games, take advantage of Xbox Music, and and if you're one of the company, if you have one of the cable services that hook into it, get your cable service through that box. So a, kind of an extender box. Don't right, know so prices I, or anything like that, but it's intriguing. I actually it's, think this is simultaneously brilliant and idiotic, and here's why. Uh, it's brilliant because that's, that's called all- brilliotic. 
that brilliantic is, is, is from Tom Merritt. Uh, it's, it's brilliant because this is all I use my current Xbox for. I don't play any AAA titles on my Xbox. If I'm going to play a video game, it's almost always on my uh, PC in my office. Uh, so essentially what they're doing is pitching a product that does exactly what I use my Xbox for. However, it's idiotic because... Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to try to play the mushy middle, and the mushy middle never plays very well. You're going to get two types of people looking at this device, either people who don't identify themselves as gamers, and they're going to look at it and say, why would I buy an Xbox? I don't play video games. Or you're going to get the other people who do identify themselves as gamers and say, why would I get this? This is a castrated Xbox that doesn't even count, and I'm afraid this thing is very firmly targeted, a niche which need not be addressed at all. Here's what I think. Uh, I'm I'm going to say that I think it's clear that uh, casual is the new hardcore. And I think that this is kind of isn't this exactly what everybody wants Apple TV to be? It's basically yes. a set top box that plays apps. And so Microsoft is like, hey, if Apple ain't going to do it, we'll do it. Uh, and I think it really um, harkens to a a change in what Xbox means. And I think it's what something Microsoft has been wanting to do for a long time. And that is sort of uh, detach Xbox from one particular SKU and one particular piece of hardware so that you can have Xbox on your Windows phone, you can have Xbox on your PC, you can have Xbox as this gaming label that allows this you know universe of online interactivity that goes across multiple different kinds of devices. And uh, I, I think that there's a possibility of, of having a schism in the audience, but I really think it's going to be, if they do this, it'll be a, a very differently positioned kind of device, and it won't really be what the next Xbox will be, which is going to have its own name, and Xbox will just be this prefix that get, gets attached to things to signify, hey, you get Xbox Live on it, and you get you know, gaming, an identity of gaming on these devices. That's, so, uh, so you that's think- a really good point because the, the, I think the key to making it work is that the new Xbox is not the Xbox 720 or the Xbox 4. or so. It's, it's, it's the Xbox Revolution or some yeah. name where you start to kind of think of that, oh, that's the one that plays all the games. And, and Brian, I get what you're saying. I think the idi- idiocy could pay off because no hardcore gamer is going to look at this thing and say, well, I'm not buying the Xbox Four or the Xbox 720 because this other thing exists, so they're not going to lose anything there. Uh, right. But they might buy it as a second device. They may say, well, I can't afford two Xboxes, but I sure would like to take advantage of some of my Xbox Gold perks in my be- back bedroom, and it acts as a second cable box for me back there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so imagine if they position this thing as your second Xbox. So then that way they get away with they sort of they sort of uh, they they capture the gamer audience to say uh, call it the Xbox satellite, where it's like it's the second Xbox mm. that does the rest of the things that you love from your Xbox, but it does it in your bedroom instead of the living room. I can see it suggest uh, succeeding like that, but again, that's it's such a weird trip wire to try to walk across is that i don't know that i'm using the phrase trip wire correctly it's like a it's like a scapegoat trip wire that you need to do a uh, a pirouette on is that is that english i'm speaking you're what happened to the goat <laughs> that's, yes that's what i'm saying right here we go um i but also think about it coming from the other direction right which is the the windows 8 user who doesn't play video games who says all yes. of a sudden, oh, I've got this Xbox Live you know, music thing that came with my Windows 8 installation, and I've got a Windows phone maybe, right. and, and now and I can buy this person. Xbox satellite that yes. allows me to get those services. The question and is, that, are there enough of those things? To, uh, listen, are there enough I, of those I, I things? Think, I mean, by I, things I mean scapegoats. No, by things I mean people. <laughs> you mean human beings, yes. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you this much. Uh, if anyone can pull off the marketing bonanza that it will take to capture both of those people, it's then Apple. it'll be, it'll be oh, Microsoft. It's Apple. Those two individual <laughs> people that they can finally get captured. Uh, Je- Jeff, do you have any, any further thoughts on, on the Xbox satellite thing? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think you make a very salient point, which is that uh, everybody wants Apple to do this, and until Apple does it, everybody else is like, "Oh, that's weird that they would do that." And then once Apple does it, it's like, "Well, it makes perfect sense." Yeah, you know, sure. everybody should be doing this. Yeah, that seems to be the history of things. All right, let's move on to another big story.
Stop everything. It's another big story. I had like 16 people recommend this story to me today, and, and the first 15 times I looked at it, I was like, eh, we talk about this all the time. Uh, but then the 16th time, I finally said, you know what, though? It's, it's a good weapon in your arsenal. If you are one of the cord cutters who watch this show and you're trying to explain to people who are like, why can't I just get HBO? Let me give you money. This, this is actually a decent uh, attempt to explain it. Peter Kafka's got a story up. We've talked about this before. The fact that the reason that HBO, in the United States anyway, won't just go straight to the consumer is they get so much marketing money from cable television. Uh, and, and, and they don't want to lose that. If, if they, they offered a straight-to-the-consumer service, no matter what the price, the cable TV companies, the satellite TV companies would all say, well, we're not going to help you, you know, build your business against us, so we're not going to market this anymore. And, and Jason, if you could play just a little bit of that uh, embedded video in there, the it's, answer is up there. it's in the especially pattern. shot with Claire Danes uh, from Homeland. Morning. Five minutes, Homeland Marathon, on demand. So apparently Showtime Showtime footed the bill to pay her to come in and do the shoot. But all the rest of the expenses of the commercial are paid for by, in this case, Time Warner Cable. Uh, yeah, it's uh, now the question is, is what we're seeing a symptom or the disease? And it clearly looks like the symptom to me. It's like at this point, the entire system from a legal framework is rigged up so that it's worth it for them to blow millions of dollars on ads like this. Right, for a in order legal to keep framework? People, uh, yes, sure. Uh, I, I, well, I mean, mainly I'm talking about the structure of the way all of these businesses operate right mm-hmm. now. It's totally worth it for them to play, to keep everyone in their ecosystem, to continue to perpetuate the myth that they're the only option when it comes to watching all of your favorite shows. Um, so, I, I mean, it's it's tough. Like, I understand why everybody forwarded this article to us. But on the flip side, it's like, it's like I, I don't know. It's like it's hard for me to want to even talk about it because it's like, yeah. Bro, that's the, the world we live in is, is I, well, old media. And that was, my, really that was my reaction over and over. But, I'm, but a lot of times it's hard for people to wrap their heads around that, even when you explain it to them. And this, to me, was the easy way to do it, to say, like, here's, here's the smoking gun. Here's the evidence, right? This ad has a big Time Warner Cable logo at the end, even though it's all about Homeland. Time Warner Cable foots the bill for marketing for Showtime. And it's Showtime in this case, but the same thing applies, Showtime or HBO. They're all getting this huge marketing bonanza from the cable companies. So, so it so just doesn't is... make sense for them to risk that for the lower reward of selling direct subscriptions over the internet at so this for, point. For everyone who sent this to us, we have to have our no agenda moment and shout, yeah, of course, wake up, sheeple. Old <laughs> media owns you. <laughs> Jeff, do you, do, do, do you get people asking you about this? Um, not, I mean, I, I, it's an interesting topic, certainly, that has come up uh, numerous times. And, yeah, I mean, the, it's exactly what you guys have been saying over and over is that what the consumer wants, which is this a la carte idea, it, it makes zero sense for cable companies to offer because uh, they're subsidizing all those other channels with the big the big dogs. And they don't want to charge you 10 bucks when they could be charging you 110 bucks. Um, so that's where we are. And... Uh, I think it's it's all going to change as as the technology continues to improve um, and people are finding other ways to get stuff than than cable. It's just glacially slow, as we all know. Yeah, exactly. It's going to take more people canceling cable, reducing their cable subscription, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before the pressure is is, is enough that the, that the the math works out where they're like, well, now the marketing benefit isn't enough because the cable companies don't have enough money to pour a bunch of money into marketing our shows for us. So now we have, we have to do something. Uh, they're just not to that point yet. Well, let's get yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. So Time Warner is sinking $40 million into Maker Studios. If you haven't heard of Maker Studios, they're a startup uh, that creates and distributes video on YouTube for the most part. They're not one of the partner-funded channels from Google. Uh, they actually they actually do it all on their own. They're very similar to Machinima, although Machinima does get a little bit of partner money from Google. Machinima also funds a lot of things uh, through them, themselves as well. 
Uh, and, and so Time Warner sinking $40 million in here is, is no chicken feed. This is exactly what YouTube has been trying to do is to say, let's, let's prove that it's worth your investment to do this. And so I, I think whether this is coming from a partner-funded channel or not, Google's, YouTube is excited to see somebody sinking $40 million into a studio that basically specializes in video on YouTube. So uh, this reminds me of, and forgive me, I can't remember if I talked about this on Frame Rate or on Twit, uh, but uh, The Walmart Effect was a fantastic book written about seven, eight years ago. And it talked about how not only did uh, Walmart have the effect of bringing lower prices to the people who shopped at Walmart, it had the counterintuitive effect of causing all the stores around or competing with Walmart to up their game as far as efficiency in their in their supply line. So there used to be a time when everybody would put their deodorant into boxes and then send them out. But Walmart was the first to say, hey, this is stupid. You're you're setting fire to five cents extra just to put deodorant in a box. Why don't you not put the deodorant in the box and just spell it, sell it as the canister that it already is? And then once they had already made that happen, then all of a sudden CVS and, and Walgreens and all all the other competitors started offering. Now you can't buy deodorant anywhere that comes in a box. And that's what's so I, wrong with our country. No, okay, yes, that's 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 the liberal run media. Uh, the uh, <laughs> but the important thing is that uh, uh, this is a Walmart effect that we're seeing as far as a flight to quality, which you and I have talked about on this show plenty of times. And this is some of the, one of the things that we hoped we would see with YouTube by virtue of Google throwing $200 million or whatever the number was at uh, at funding high-quality channels. Now, all of a sudden, we have this halo effect where all of a sudden it's worth it to these other content providers to up their game as well. And so this is fantastic. It's a testament to Google doing the right thing with its partner funding, and it's a testament to the sea change that we're seeing shifted in, uh, in new media. I guess the question is, is this a, a, a unique thing, or is this the, the leading edge of a wave? Uh, so are we, are we going to see more things like this? I, w I would like to think it's the leading edge of a wave. I mean, I, I would like to think that, of course, you know, YouTube's initial round of funding was the beginning of the wave and that we're just seeing more and more follow through. But certainly if this is a trend, uh, consumers only stand to benefit from this kind of thing because it means more of the qual quality content that they like online available at a uh, in a business model that is superior to the stupid old way of doing things. Also buried in the bottom of this story about Yahoo possibly uh, making a bid for TV Guide, which is sort of interesting on its own, uh, M&A point person Jackie Reeses from Yahoo apparently, according to this Kara Swisher article, looking at everything in the world, including Maker Studios. Uh, so that could be an interesting turn of events if Yahoo were to buy Maker Studios... Uh, paying off the Time Warner investment, obviously, if, if they did that, or maybe joining in a joint venture, and, and then operating on YouTube. Jeff, does that, that kind of turns the world upside down, where Yahoo used it, to be in the content play game. Yeah, it, it really does. And um, I really don't know how I feel about this. I, don't, I, I wish I had the, um, the faith in it that, that Brian does. Um, and it sounds weird coming from a guy that, you know, up until today made my living <laughs> off of... <laughs> off of uh, the internet and producing video content on the internet. Um, I just, I, I'm not convinced that the structure is there for this to succeed yet. And uh, it's clearly going to happen. And, and it's, it, I think it is the beginning of a wave of really breaking down those walls and those barriers between what is television, what is internet, what, you know, what is produced for these different delivery systems it's all going to be one thing at a certain point but right now I, I i'm not convinced that um you know throwing 40 million dollars at youtube video makers is going to yield the kinds of results that that i as a viewer want i want to be wrong um because i think it's a i think it's a good trend and it's an exciting trend and it's it's infusing the the bottom with with funds to to sort of bubble up some great quality, but, um, you know, with some notable exceptions, I haven't really seen this surge of awesome quality online. It's still, you know, it's still the same, you know, I like watching bacon pancakes, but that's because, it, you know, it was made by people who got to make a show for, for cable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, I don't know. Well, it, it, it's not a surge online. It's, it's a slow rise. It's that mm. it's, it's, 
I guess tsunamis sometimes do that. It's not. I was going to say it's not a tsunami. It's just, it's it's like the ri- the t- the flood that you can avoid because you see it rising, but but it's 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 going to flood you. Um, it's like the faucet drip that slaughters your family. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> the murderous homicidal faucet drip. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, man, uh, I'll tell you specifically, it's like uh, there's some part of me that feels weird and almost dirty about uh, about the fact that we're talking about the acquisition of TV Guide or whatever. It's like, uh, like ah, the acquisition of TV Guide. What's next? The thrifty nickel? The green sheets? Which of these old media powerhouses is next to fall? I, I don't know. It's it's. <laughs> It's. I understand strategically you go for a bargain, but it's like on the. Who cares about TV Guide? Well, I, it's an old I, dead honestly, medium. The, only, an old dead the, the reason I threw that in there was because of the Maker Studio line. The TV Guide thing is of mild interest. Sure, you know. Sure, and it's TVGuide.com that they're that they're they're going after. They don't they don't care about the green sheet or the thirsty sure. nickel. <laughs> Or the, and the Bond uh, County and, and Shopper. What about the yellowpages.com? It's, right. it's the new competitor to forgive, the Googles. Forgive my ignorance, but I actually have absolutely no idea what TVGuide.com does. Is it a news site or is it literally where you go to find out what's on Channel 5 at 6 o'clock? You can, it's <laughs> both. It is just like TV, the TV Guide channel showed yeah. you the, the schedule scrolling, but they had original programs at the top. TVGuide.com does like entertainment news, but they well, also so still far, have the like you can look up what's on now. If you look at it right now, it certainly looks an awful lot like frame rate. It's uh, what's hot, what's renewed slash canceled, and Walking Dead. So it's pretty much frame rate. <laughs> and but in a print then video. Monday Night Football. And we take it right. Uh, all right, let's let's finish off with our fourth big story. So Brian, you threw this in GigaOM, uh, saying that the uh, demand for mobile data has doubled in the past 12 months, according to a new report from Ericsson. Uh, and the the cause is video. Everybody watching, you know, banana pancakes or uh, bacon pancakes. Or Jack <laughs> Johnson's banana hours. pancakes, possibly. Either one uh, uh, on, on their tablets. Yeah, well, first of all, I put this in uh, partly because this was sent to us uh, on our email. Uh, and I love the fact that people are not only giving us interesting questions to talk about at the end of the show, but sending in stories that they think would be a good match for us. So make sure to send those in to fr at twit.tv. Uh, but in this case, uh, specifically, uh, out of everything, if you take a look at the breakdown of of how people look at uh, uh, their media or what their data is is used for, here we go. Let me go ahead and throw that on there. You can see here you've got a mobile PC, tablet, and smartphones. You can see that uh, online video is the purple chunk, that giant what thirty five percent on there. And there's something about looking at that graph that just makes me inherently mad because this is how they're breaking down and charging us for our use. But is this in any way an accurate breakdown of how we actually spend our time when we're online using uh, using our media con- or internet connected devices. So, uh, I mean, it's good in that certainly anything that makes it more clear to the big wigs that everybody's watching video is good, but also it kind of makes me mad that uh, that this is how they're charging us, but it's not the way we spend our time on the devices. Yeah, well, no, the way you talk about the way they're charging us is the fictional bucket of bits that doesn't Correct. exist. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's always – that's another one of those, like, yeah, HBO is not going to go direct because of the marketing benefit they get from cable companies. Yeah, it's right. just beating your head against the wall against – about and that if, stuff. If, if you look at it, by the way, for, just to break it down, uh, this purple is software downloads. Uh, green is email. Dark green is encrypted uh, use, um, which we all know is pornography. Uh, and then yellow is social networking. Really s- small amount is- of pornography. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> that's, that's, but you notice it. Pornography you notice by people more- worried about getting caught versus the, <laughs> yeah, the other parts. <laughs> That's just like hardcore dark stuff. Yeah, uh, you got you got the orange, which is red web, web browsing, purple online video, online audio, and then file sharing. So, uh, uh, which again, like I'm I'm surprised to see. I guess mobile PC they're talking about um, you know connected device broadband connected devices that uh, that use 3G networks. I assume netbooks, maybe PC. ultrabooks. I'd be curious what the actual definition is as well. But yeah. I was trying yeah. to figure out what the other would be, but I guess gaming is not listed there, so gaming would be a big part of what oh, other. Oh, sure, is. yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, gaming traffic and uh, number All of, of other those, uh, 
all of those planes that I bought in pocket planes, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Some data. You've got a problem, Tom. I forgot to tell you, this entire episode is an intervention. This <laughs> welcome to Frame Rate, where we stop Tom and his plane buying. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, that, I, won't even, I, I haven't played it in months, Jabron, okay? <laughs> See, look, okay, the first step I is can stop you got to stop time. Denying, right? You, you, exactly. Denial is the first <laughs> it's step. It's actually the you problem is past. I spent all that money on the stupid plane bucks, and I haven't played the thing in months. Now, now it's reminding me I've got to go back and start playing. It's, it's had the opposite effect. <laughs> Some of you guys are into letterpress now. Yes. Letterpress is owning my life. Yeah. God, I love it. But the love nice thing so about letterpress is it doesn't take up all your time. You know, you can right. really play it casually. It does. Well, Actually, if you've do got you 50 games going, it can take up all your time. <laughs> all right, I'm, just, uh, and, I'm doing and it actually, wrong. <laughs> real quick, I want to ask. I want to ask Jeff if he's of the same mind on this. I think the most brilliant thing about letterpress is I every time I play, I feel like I'm kicking the other person's ass, and I honestly <laughs> yeah. don't know which games I've won or lost. It's it's <laughs> it's the perfect game because when you lose. It's not like there's flags and banners or whatever. Like, I forget to even check. I'm like, oh, oh, did I lose that game? Oh, I but don't think like you're really Veronica anymore. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you definitely kicked my butt a couple of times, Brian. So <laughs> let's not talk about that anymore. All right. Uh, let's thank our sponsor instead. Pond5, the stock media marketplace of the future is here now. You don't have to pay crazy amounts of money you don't have to hire a lawyer to review all the images and videos you want in fact if, if you're looking for photos vector illustrations music tracks sound effects customizable motion graphic templates 3d models and more they're, they're adding things all the time everything you need to be the content creator that makes the stuff that we're talking about is available See, this is, from Palm This 5. is what's amazing, Tom, is of all the times for this to be our sponsor, this is perfect because I'm in the middle of putting together an epic mockumentary about my crushing defeat of one Jeff Kanata at Letterpress. And I was just thinking, like, what I need to do <laughs> is I need stock media that kind of tells what word games are all about. So I went and I typed in word games to Pond5, and I was able to get photos, video. I, I don't think I see any sound effects just yet. Here, type that in there, word games, and then boom, put that that Dalmatian, that's my money Sad maker. dog face. Yeah, yeah. that that's, looks like, see, oh, that's, that's me like, trying to figure it, it out. Says on there, exactly. That, that's, <laughs> I'm just going to put the words Jeff Kanata and an arrow at that Dalmatian. That's my poster, as seen at Sundance Film Festival. There are 679 vector illustrations for word games. <laughs> there are 48 sound effects for word games in there. Hold on, I got to hear what a uh, word game sound effect is here. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn up this volume here, so hopefully you don't hear yourself. <laughs> here we go. Ten, nine, eight, Whoa. seven, Pond six, five. Five, com. Also a self destruct sequence. <laughs> it reminds me of a of a Star Trek. Uh, uh, was it Star Trek Three? The Search for Spock when they get on the the ship and they're like, "It's there, there's a, only one woman voice talking," and, and they pay fifty percent royalties for each and every sale if you upload your own stuff there. That's a higher payout than a lot of other stock photo marketplaces. Uh, so if you're a photographer, uh, either video or or still, you, you might want to check out that end of the business as well. Prices are unbeatable, and so is the range and the quality, as as you, as you know. Uh, so if you're you're making a film and you're like, you know what, I'd like to get started with a spaceship approaching a star. There's a there's they have it. They have the CG effects. You don't have to be a big effects house. They have it right there. You can download lots of different angles, lots of different styles, a bunch of different sound effects. In fact. This month, you can get 50 free stock media downloads at pond5.com slash frame rate uh, and, and get started right away. You don't even have to pay anything. 50 free stock media downloads, pond5.com slash frame rate. Go check it out. Start your, We're still waiting on a movie to be made from the 50 free stock media downloads. Yeah, and let me tell you, man, it ain't rocket science. We're not going to grade you on some kind of like it, harsh criticism. Here's just, the thing. It could be rocket science, but you don't have to know any rocket science. You just type sure. in rocket science just and then take the, all the all photos the and put them together. Yeah. Of course. Pondfrance.com slash frame rate. We thank them for their support of frame rate, the name of this show. It's time for Is the it? slipstream. BitTorrent is looking for webcasters to test P2P live streaming. This is actually old. They've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I know GigaRobes yeah. just got a new story about it. But, yeah, if, uh, they've been doing that. We actually had, uh, um, we had them on Twit several months ago, and we started doing some P2P live streaming. So if you haven't heard about this, it's a cool thing 
Brom Cohen is out there saying, hey, we need testers. We're inviting qualified broadcasters to help us build something amazing. Well, and we, we talked about the infrastructure of them building this, uh, man, I think over a year ago on this show. But uh, but uh, the fact that they're now at the point where they're courting personalities to be representative of the brand is a good sign. Number one, it shows they got past the first phase of building the infrastructure, but it shows that they're in it for the long haul and that they want to court personalities. Uh, this is a good sign of a maturing uh, I guess, uh, development. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what is more of a question for me is what video is going to end up being VDO, VDIO from the folks who brought you RDO, RDIO. Uh, it is, it, they've got a, an updated website up. They're still not open yet. They're still in private beta, but according to all the stuff that people are gleaning from, from this site, it looks like you'll be able to sign in with your RDO account. And then it's just going to be your typical online TV marketplace. You can do rentals, you can do purchases and downloads, and they'll manage the downloads, and you can play them on multiple devices. They're going to have apps probably for, for multiple platforms. I'm a little disappointed if that's what this ends up being, because I was hoping video would be like audio. Like, oh, we finally figured out the, like, pay a subscription fee and watch whatever you want for, for each month. I think it's just going to be all the videos of the band Dio. <laughs> Ronnie James Dio all you can watch <laughs> finally well, somebody and, got and my we, letters we, we've, we've talked about this before in that we've hoped that uh, because Spotify or the company that's doing the HBO Go we hope that, that it would much as we saw Spotify kind of bubble and brew over in Europe and then suddenly launch full fledged in the United States we're hoping to see the same thing happen with HBO Go I wonder how much of it is us, us, us projecting that same anticipation and, and hopefulness onto this other service with RDO. It's a little bit of that. It's also that it comes from Janice Fries. Uh, you know, and Janice is one of the co-founders of Skype, uh, brought RDO. RDO has been, you know, they're not Spotify. They don't get all of the darling love from Silicon Valley necessarily, but they're very successful in subscription music. On the other hand, they're also the folks who brought you Juiced. Uh, and most of you don't <laughs> well, remember. Now, hold on. I'll defend Juiced because Juiced was actually my first awesome uh, it, online video watching experience. It was the first time that I had seen enough of, and again, like it's got the Netflix disease where it's like it's not the quality that you really hoped was there, but that was how I originally watched all of Dog Bites Band, which I think is one of the greatest, most underrated series in all of Comedy Central's history. So it's just stop digging on Juiced, sir. They were pioneers. I, I watched a bunch of Showtime shows on Juiced. They were, it was amazing what, what they had there, but they did not succeed. That's, that's all I'm no. saying. Too uh, what else also did not succeed is Disney Movies Online. Do you, either of you ever hear of Disney Movies Online? Uh, no. no. I think I might have heard of it, but I certainly couldn't swear to it. Uh, but they announced they're going to shut down their streaming service. It was an online movie streaming service from Disney, streaming Disney movies. How, do I, how have I never heard of that? <laughs> well, I, exactly. Uh, and they're like, yeah, nobody's using it, so... Uh, if you, that if, nobody's heard of it. <laughs> if you had a code, I guess they, some DVDs came with codes for free movies on the service. Uh, you can now convert the codes to be used for iTunes or Windows Media Player. Uh, and those people who actually paid for the service have until the end of February to request a refund. Well, hmm. good on those people, I guess. Now, I Disney know. is the one major studio that's not involved in Ultraviolet. They have their own system uh for disney movies anywhere and in fact this engadget story suggests that there might be a new system coming called disney movies anywhere uh based on the key chess system that they they use uh but it doesn't seem like disney wants to join ultraviolet i'll, I'll you tell you what in the that, meantime i'm sorry go right. ahead jeff i was just say you would think that uh, of all the studios they would be the one that would most benefit from having their own closed environment because it could say hey it's safe for kids you know, just let your kids have a subscription here. They can watch all family-friendly entertainment and no worries for you that they're, you know, going off into another section of ultraviolet that they're not supposed to be in or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, and, and I don't know how much this is affiliated with, like, what I have been seeing, of course, I've got two kids that are exactly the Disney demographic, aged five and, and eight. Uh, and there's ads every 20 minutes talking about, like, watch new episodes of Jesse on your iPad or iPhone or whatever. So I don't know if this is the same service providing the, mul the mobile content no, or not. No, it's not. That's a different but thing. It, Okay, yeah, because like when we go online and we look at the Disney Channel stuff, uh, I mean, it's a hot mess. It's it's from a consumer point of view, it's a labyrinth that I just can't 
extra, you know, get through. Yeah. Uh, ESPN, on the other hand, is a Disney company, but they're doing uh, great stuff on the Xbox. Last week, watch ESPN launch. Now, granted, this is one of those things where you have to have the right cable company, so which means you have to live in the right part of the United States uh, to get this. But if you're with Time Warner Cable, Bright House, Verizon Fios, Xfinity from Comcast, or Mid-Continent Communications... You can authenticate on your Xbox and use Watch ESPN. It's, it's similar to what's available on iOS and Android, but there's all kinds of crazy stuff. Pretty much everything that's live sports that ESPN offers is available on here. You can do dual screen. Uh, you can customize highlights to say, like, these are my favorite teams. Just show me the news Niners. for these teams. Uh, yeah, the uh, guy from GeekWire who, uh, who did the, the demo video is a big Niners fan, apparently. So he, he was he was demoing the Bears Niners game that was going on when he recorded this. But have either of you played with this? I I've taken a look at it. Of course, I'm not inherently big on sports ball, as as you well know, Tom. Uh, but out of any uh, form of content, I can think of nothing where uh, latency will play a bigger role. Mm. Than in sports programming because like you don't want to be the idiot who's cheering for a play and then find out that that play happened two minutes ago or whatever it's like uh, well two minutes would matters. be a lot the lag they said the lag was about 10 seconds from live right which is great i mean that's that's what you want and of course you know to you'll notice that one of the things being featured is the ability to check in on other games of course you want those stats to be as real time as you could possibly make them uh, i think this is a fascinating experience uh, or experiment and i i believe that this will be the outlier of of what eventually shapes the infrastructure for on-demand content of all varieties. Well, and what you get is if you subscribe to one of these cable companies and you have an Xbox, you can watch ESPN in a, in a room that you don't have a cable box in. And, and that, yes. that could be a compelling part of that Xbox TV offering. But, but I'll tell you, I actually am really curious to hear what Jeff thinks of this because I know that you are a sports fan, right? I always see you yeah. tweeting about the sports, talking to Don Fubar. I do love the sports. Uh, I haven't played around with this specifically. I have heard horror stories of uh, of the PSN version of, of people trying to get MLB content and uh, and NFL content and, and NHL content, for that matter, and having all kinds of connection problems. I, I think a lot of that has been worked out recently, but um, I think until you uncouple the stranglehold that Direct TV, for example, has on NFL content. Like, it's great that you get ESPN. That's cool. But, um, and, and it's awesome if you're a fan of a sport that Americans don't ju- usually like, like soccer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because then you can watch a whole bunch of great content that isn't, advertisers aren't. There's <laughs> amazing to. rugby on the ESPN3 app on the Xbox. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, but uh, what I want and what needs to happen, and it's, it's exactly, it mirrors the story we were talking about earlier with HBO, is to be able to just subscribe to the 49ers. All I want is all the Niner games. Uh, deliver them to me. However, I will pay. I just don't want to buy the NFL Sunday ticket and get all the games because I'm not going to watch 12 NFL games on one day. I only want to watch my team, and I happen to live in Los Angeles where my team is rarely televised. Yeah. So what I want is, you know, give me 60 bucks for the season of my team, not $400 for all the teams, and that, you know? And that's what's interesting about this. Watch ESPN could do that because basically it says you, you got Time Warner Cable, you got Verizon Fios, no problem, log in. We'll, you can watch everything on demand. Uh, so every 49ers game that, that's on ESPN is going to be available for you on demand. But there's your problem. If it's college or, or, or uh, college basketball, college football, you got a better chance. But how many 49ers games are on ESPN? They're on right. lots of different channels. It's not like you can, like you say, subscribe to the 49ers. So it right. still kind of falls short. Now, most of us on this panel are not Canadian. What? <laughs> how dare you, sir? You don't. I don't prejudge you. I don't look at you and say you look like someone who spent a lot of time in Texas. But I'm right, aren't I? Brian, you do Brian are like you Canadian? Canadian? No, <laughs> no. Jeff, are you Canadian? No, no. Dude, I no, buddy, no, buddy, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, buddy. What are, what are you talking about? No, not me, buddy. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> uh, all appearances aside, none of us are Canadian. Uh, but the Canadians will be very excited that Netflix has struck a deal with Warner Brothers in the past few months. Uh, that will now bring lots of TV shows and movies to Netflix in Canada. The Vampire Diaries, Fringe, Pretty Little Liars, movies like The Hangover Part 2, Horrible Bosses, uh, The Dark Knight Rises. 
Um, I'll tell you what, coming. like this is not just a big story for Canadians. This is a big story for anyone who has to deal with Canadians or people who <laughs> are from Australia or the UK. Like I get people on scam school who just on the YouTube comments, like the most popular comment on our most recent thing is like, stop advertising. Netflix is not available here. Like people get wound up about this. So this is you guys should be applauding the fact that the Netflix virus is spreading itself throughout everywhere. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, also, you should be proud, whether you're Canadian or not, uh, that you can now pop out videos from YouTube in a nice, simple little pop-out player. They've, they've changed the pop-out player. Uh, on the same gadget story, they said it looked like a test, but pretty much every computer I've tried this on, the new pop-out player looks like what they're describing. Uh, so you right-click on a playing video in YouTube, choose pop-out, and it, it's this really sleek-looking uh, pop-out player. And then apparently when you click the home button in there, it takes you to something called YouTube Trends, which gives you currently trending uh, stuff. Was it not, this is not happening to you, Jason? I'm about to, about to try it out here. <laughs> All right, so you right click in the video. Right click right. in the video and choose pop out. Pop out. Well, there it is, oh. third one. And there you go, see, you get this nice. What? And then you can close the main, uh, the main page and you still, you still have the video That's playing. Cool. So you can kind like of that. throw it over, Although obviously, it's... or maybe not playing, in Jason's case. I don't know why so, that's... So, it's just yeah. a pop-out logo display. <laughs> yeah, it is for him. Yeah, apparently so. That's yeah, weird. no, I've got I've got it too. Here we go. If I click on there, I'm clicking on pop-out, and then it shows me oh, this thing card. right here. Yeah. yeah, there we go. And it pops on there. Yeah, look yeah, at that, man. That's awesome. That's nice and slick, huh? Yeah, I like yeah. it. Yeah. And then if you click on, click the home button, Brian. Click the home button. You see that little house uh, there, right there? Yeah. And then, oh, then you get this what? little YouTube trends thing. Yeah. So instead of taking it back to the main page, they give, right, you, now, they give you access to everything. What's funny is like I, I want to reach forward and actually touch this and swipe it over because it's showing oh, me it like a hint internet. of the next yeah. thing. But I don't know how to click. Uh, I guess I got to click. Keyboard right is what Chad yelled at me just now. Keyboard right? That's dumb. Why can't I yeah, just touch my go. screen? <laughs> I don't know. Did, did you buy a touch screen? No. Well, there you go. Okay. All right. <laughs> <I wonder> why. <laughs> Glad we cleared up that mystery, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we also uh, here in the uh, uh, in the tube tops land have some news for you. Ooh. Caught myself before I went into tube tops. It was good. Well done. <laughs> That's very slick, very slick, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> Nintendo Wii U has been out for a week. I actually used it at Thanksgiving and felt like, okay, this is what it's for. Uh, okay, yep. so, so, so you, like, you, right. you were happy with it. Jeff, did you get a Wii U? I, I have one, yep, sitting right behind me. Okay, so uh, obviously on this show, you know, there, there's all kinds of things we could talk about as far as the hardware and the video game side of things, but the thing we were most excited about was the TV feature and the integrated second screen experience that you could get. Uh, have you used any of that stuff? Yeah, very slick. It's very slick. I think it's, uh, it's, it's the future of well, how all these um, devices are going to interact with your TV. I, the fact that it's a small thing. It really is a very minor thing. But the fact that you can pick up the, the Wii pad, turn on your television, select the correct input, turn on your Wii U, and start playing a game all with one remote, it's pretty cool. And as I said, very minor detail, but a cool detail nonetheless. And I think that that's going forward how these devices are all going to integrate into your living room. So if you've been waiting, TV, the TVII service has not yet launched, but everything else has. You got Hulu Plus, you got Amazon, you got YouTube, uh, you got Netflix. Netflix was there at the beginning, but they all came pretty quickly within that week. And I, I thought it was pretty cool that you could, you watch the Hulu videos on the gamepad itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that if you, you know, if somebody else was playing something or, or doing something else on the TV, you could actually play, you know, instead of just playing games, you could also watch videos on the tablet. Um, but yeah, definitely like a bunch of people playing at once with like three week remotes and, and the gamepad made that make sense. I agree. Yeah, so, we had a really fun time at a, at a Thanksgiving party um, playing uh, Mario Chase just over and over and over. Everybody laughing, having a great time. Passing oh yeah, the, around hi the, the hide and seek one. That's so much fun, right? Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, and, and yeah, you pass around the gamepad, different people get to play, play the ghost uh, in Nintendo Land, it's sort of a similar thing to Mario Chase. Yep. Uh, Verizon FiOS uh, mobile app for iPad updated now, so you can stream access to 75 channels, still limited to your home Wi-Fi, unfortunately. 
but but you can uh, you can now get live streaming. The Verizon FiOS mobile app up until now did not give you any streaming access. It was just basically a big fancy remote. So baby yep. steps, Tom. They're called baby steps. You got to exactly. give them. You got to give them a moment. They got to walk before they fly. Verizon just has to step on a few more babies. And That's right. <laughs> everything you need. It'll be worth it, though. Totally exactly. worth it. <laughs> Let's check in on Film Foul. <laughs> Film Foul is all about the things you can watch. And uh, Brian pointed me uh, towards this Breaking the Taboo documentary. Uh, it's, a, it's a war on drugs documentary, and it features Morgan Freeman as the narrator, uh, Presidents Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter saying we need to change uh, our, our tenor and our, our, our rhetoric around drugs uh, in, in the world. But I, I, aside from the topic and whatever you think of the topic, it's premiering on YouTube on December 7th and then coming to TV next year. And I thought for something, you know, this, this big and impactful that has some really huge names, historical names uh, attached to it, to, to premiere it on YouTube first and then go to TV is an interesting strategy. Well, and, and it feels so right, doesn't it? Because the war on drugs is something that uh, increasingly, as time goes on, starts to feel more and more like a top-down, uh, politically motivated institution uh, where, you know, you start to see increasing surveys that show that more and more people are accepting of the idea of legalization of marijuana and possibly other hard drugs as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly people are not a fan of the 47,000 people dying at the you know uh, south of the border and about uh, the side effects of the war on drugs but uh so so with that being the case it it, it kind of makes sense that you would have this coming together of big name political celebrities obviously bill clinton and and jimmy carter and uh also hollywood celebrities with morgan freeman and obviously somebody's footing the bill behind all of this but it makes sense that it would be an internet distributed Thing. It seems like they are from the beginning trying to capture that same kind of uh, grassroots uh, distribution that made for previous countercultural viral hits. Uh, and it'll be interesting to watch this thing launch. Now, the difference is, is a lot of those other things, whether it be your Coney 2012 or your Loose Change documentary or whatever, you know, those those are all uh, those were all stories after the fact of their launch. The fact that we can see this kind of money and this kind of potential going into it being announced in advance. It'll be interesting to see how this goes once it actually launches. Yeah, and, and whatever you think, I'm sure there's people out there who are like, I disagree with everything this documentary stands for and everything it's saying. Uh, that's fine. I still think it's, it's even of interest to some, some folks who have that viewpoint because what you used to do is you'd take a documentary and you'd like try to get it at a film festival. You, you'd try to show it at some art houses and, and, and get, get the wheels rolling that way. Jeff, do you think this is a viable new path for documentary filmmakers? Absolutely. I think it's a viable new path for any kind of filmmaker. And I think that, as I said earlier, that going forward, we're going to see this breaking down of what is right. We're going to see a breaking down of, of things limited to their distribution model and it being like, well, it's not a real movie because it's only on the Internet or, you know, it's going to come out wherever it's going to come out and it's going to get buzz in a numerous different places. And if you want to see it on a big screen, you'll see it on a big screen. If you want to see it on a small screen, you get to see it on a small screen. I think, I think it's great. And I, um, I, I'm excited to check it out. And I feel like Brian, you, you alluded to this. It's sort of a, a fall, a, a logical follow on to Coney 2012. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, and, and again, the difference, of course, uh, Coney 2012, for good or for ill, kind of, you know, just struck like a thunderclap and then fizzled into nothing uh, f from a political fizzled standpoint. Fizzled naked guy on the street corner. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Into. <laughs> it, it came in like a documentary. It went out like a guy masturbating on the street. Um, <laughs> this is a case where we know. Just what, like March. Uh, <laughs> oh that that old chestnut <laughs> we're gonna use cliches now did march come in like a documentary this year i can't remember <laughs> but the important thing the important thing is unlike any of those previous instances uh this of course you know we're seeing it coming in advance and i i'm gonna watch this with great interest partly you know i'll, I'll be the first to admit part of it is because i agree with uh you know the fact that we do uh to me desperately need to rethink our drug policy here in the United States, but also because, you know, the fact that they are staking a claim, this is the, the opportunity for that Babe Ruth called shot moment on the internet. They're in advance letting us know that this is coming. They're pointing to the bleachers and we'll see if they actually make it happen. Yeah. 
All right, uh, let's uh, talk about Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Uh, hiring, uh, we could, well, we got some new new ideas or new information about who the, who or what they are hiring. Uh, it looks like Lawrence Kasdan and uh, Simon Kinberg have agreed to write the eighth and ninth episodes of the Star Wars trilogy that Disney will be putting together. We don't know who's doing which one of them, uh, but but some more names. But to, to okay, throw but in they're the definitely pot. not working on it together. Uh, I assume they're working in tandem. Obviously, they'll be in communication because there are beats that one movie will hit that need to be followed up on the other. But but this is not a case where the two of them are working together on either of the movies. They're both working on independent films. Uh, that's the way I read it. Am I wrong about that? I have no idea. I'm asking you. That's that's. I, yeah. I would guess that this it's all a sort of a collaborative process, but that's a guess. I'll tell you what this reminds me of. Oh yeah, like, Hollywood Reporter saying the pair will write either episode eight. Or, or nine. Uh, so it okay. looks like they're working on it together. You're right. All right. Well, right on. Well, I'll tell you, regardless, man, it's like there's no more potent magical fairy dust that you could sprinkle on a Star Wars movie than associating anyone from The Empire Strikes Back. I mean, there was a time when they were casting about for writers and directors for uh, the original prequel trilogies before George Lucas was announced as the one helming all of them. There was talk about Irvin Kirshner directing. And I remember, you know, in college thinking, holy cow, this would be the best thing ever. And unfortunately, Irvin Kirshner, of course, was like, I'm old. Get out of my, get off my lawn. <laughs> he was old when he directed Empire, for that yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah it's uh, true. But Lawrence Kasdan, uh, you know, he's, he, he's amazing. Uh, obviously, everybody knows his son is also amazing. But, I mean, if you, ha- if you haven't seen The Big Chill or Grand Canyon or Body Heat, uh, these are movies that you need to go watch immediately, if not sooner, because they are uh, three of my favorite movies, <laughs> and he's responsible for them. And Jeff will be insulted if you don't go watch them. Personally you personally insulted. hate yeah. Jeff Kanata unless you watch those <laughs> movies immediately. Stop watching this broadcast. Immediately go watch these movies. Yeah, Hollywood Reporter says the exact division of responsibilities is yet to be determined. It implies they'll be, they'll be collaborating on, on the scripts. Uh, so that, that will be interesting to see what they end up And X-Men First Class, you know, uh, for, not, for like uh, First Kinberg. Class. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's got Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, which I was not thrilled with. Mr. Mrs. Smith, which I was not thrilled with. But Jumper. What, you didn't like Mr. Mrs. Smith? I thought that was adorable. Mr. Mrs. Smith was okay. Not my favorite. Mm. No, sir. Mm. Yeah. Did not care for. Reminded but, you, you know, too much of promising. your own marriage? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, well, and actually, I mean, that's the thing, of course. Mr. Oh. And Mrs. Smith immediately starts with the tropes that to anyone in a long-term relationship instantly recognized. I, I think that's what I loved about it. Yeah, actually. maybe. Uh, bad news on the Sherlock front. Uh, the idea was that they were going to start shooting on the third series of Sherlock in January. It's almost a spoiler to say they're shooting a third series, but they are. Um, uh, but it's not going to happen in January. Everybody's too busy. Uh, obviously, some people are being uh, evil people in Star Trek's next movie. Uh, uh, Stephen Moffat is directing Doctor Who, uh, and, and there's a Hobbit in the mix. Uh, so it doesn't look like they're going to get started filming until March, which means we might not get Series 3 until, like, the holiday season 2013. I'll tell you what, man. Of all the reasons to have a delay, because the three primary actor or, or developers, you know, the two two of the main actors and the writer are too busy being incredibly awesome in all of the other endeavors, It's a, that's a pretty good reason to have to delay. Also, Paul McGeegan, the uh, director, is attached to the new version of Frankenstein. For Fox, I didn't realize that till I just read it there. I did not know that. So there's there's a new Frankenstein coming from Fox. You you've seen Sherlock, right, Jeff? Oh yes, love it, it with my so whole heart. Yeah. So yes, I, I, I my money is the best version of Sherlock ever put to film. I, it, it's so good that I've refused to watch Elementary because it you know bears too much of a resemblance to what they tried to correct and actually try to create in Sherlock, and it's like I don't even want to look at it. Elementary is surprisingly good. I was I was shocked. I mean, it's no Sherlock. It's just not even in the same that's, league. But that's the problem. I watched Elementary's first episode, and I thought, "Wow, I would absolutely love this if Sherlock had never been made." I would sure. be like over the moon, like this is great, and Lucy Liu is amazing, and and then watching it, I'm like, "Yeah, it's, it's pretty good." That's even how I felt about the Robert Downey Jr. films. Yeah, like I can't, I couldn't help but go. Yeah, but there's this awesome BBC yeah. TV series that's so much better. At least with yeah. the Downey films, they're different. They are set in the past. They're trying to be a little yeah. truer to the source material. Uh, so you could say, well, that's an entirely different take uh, if you right. want to. But um, there you go. 
How do you guys feel about the fact that Size Gundam Style has now passed Justin Bieber's Baby as the most watched video on YouTube with over 805 million views in less than five months and possibly going to hit a billion views by December 11th? Yeah, and actually Couldn't right to now... A nicer style. It's <laughs> couldn't happen to a nicer style. That's awesome. Uh, the uh, uh, number one, it's uh, I think this is less a referendum on how amazing this particular video is, but more referendum on how fast things have changed about our viewing habits. As we go to the Internet as our primary source for places that we watch music videos, this is going to happen faster and faster as we have uh, international, you know, cultural phenomenons happening. And I've said on the show previously that there will never be another thriller out there. That that thriller was an artifact of uh, a a tightly held industry by a conglomerate of a few people doing distribu distribution to uh, you know worldwide. And as a result, we would just never see those those numbers again. But stuff like this actually inspires me. That uh, you realize that this thing's on track to cross a billion views in the next month or so. I mean, uh, like since this article came out, we're already up another 15, 20 million dollars uh, or 20 million views over the 805 million that was previously mentioned. Do you guys remember what the number was when you first saw this video? 600,000. I totally do. Wow. Because we were totally, we were playing it up on You, were on, you were on the, we were on the ball yeah, with that. It was probably... No, not much farther on from that because I saw it after you played it on NSFW. Chad was playing it the next day, uh, but I don't remember what the number was. Yeah, we're all I, I was definitely in the millions. I was in the millions, yeah, but I couldn't believe it. I was like, this has already got 20 million views. This is crazy. I definitely then, have that yeah. Kennedy was shot moment like in my mind. Like I remember where <laughs> I was the first time I ever saw it. So you saw that image right there? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> With the guy in the elevator. I think he's shooting yeah. Kennedy in a way right there. He's sort of shooting the Kennedy inside all of us. <laughs> <laughs> is that too soon? I don't know. With crotch bullets. Uh, let's, just in case, let's move on to the frame rate NSFW show winter new movie draft. Almost said summer. It's winter. It's winter. So Brian Brushwood leading the pack still. A week of Twilight does not get Sarah Lane even into second place. She's still in third place, but right on the heels of Scott Johnson at 263 well, keep, million. Yeah, keep in mind that Sarah's got a lot more juice left. She's got more movies coming down, right? Is that what else she got? She has um She Red does Dawn. have Killing Them Softly, and that's it. Oh, wow. Holy cow. So she is. She's going oh, to fizzle. Red Dawn is out, and she had $22 million out of that in opening weekend. So it all, and by the way, this is a war between you and me, because I'm at $356 million, and you're already oh. at $100 million. So really, it boils down to, first of all, Hobbit. number one, I do Hobbit believe just Robert Young is about to win his first stake, because... Uh, because Rise of the Guardians most certainly did not make the numbers I was thinking it would. Wow, yeah. Um, no, I was really disappointed. It, I mean, Rise of the Guardians did fine. It did $32 million. It was the, the, the best of the movies that are in our draft from this, from this last weekend. But I really expected it to be over $50 million. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, but at $32 million on a Thanksgiving weekend, I'm really shocked that it did uh, so poorly, especially since it has, you know, uh, Santa Claus and well, uh, people, all the other. Well, people didn't go to movies. They were all shopping. Or I guess so. Spending money like crazy. Yeah. No, definitely. Uh, so I'll tell you what. It all boils down to. I think it's a two man race between you and me. With uh, with if if the Hobbit makes more than two hundred and fifty million locally, then then you've got this thing. But I am shocked. Like I think I'll trickle forward another maybe twenty million or so in the rest of the draft and end up around three hundred and seventy five million. And then really for you, it's all about the Hobbit. Yeah, I've got $100 million in the bank. I think Rise of the Guardians will, will definitely contribute for another week. Um, but obviously, it's, you know, it, it, I don't, I, now I wonder if it's even going to break $100 million, uh, total. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Hobbit comes out this weekend in Wellington for the, for the pre, you know, the, the sort of the red carpet in New Zealand. So we're getting very close. It, it premieres in the U.S. December 14th. Uh, this week is Killing Them Softly. That's Sarah's last movie. Uh, and then uh, next week is playing for keeps. That's Justin Robert Young's movie. I yeah. think uh, well, if, we'll if you want, if you want my, if I'm if I'm a betting man on you guys, uh, it all comes down to when you do the cutoff for the date of your of your when when this all ends because Tom's going to have no problem with the Hobbit. No problem. It's a month winning. after the last movie, so I'll have through the end of January. Okay, yeah. I think I think you're going to sail to victory with the Hobbit. I think it'll be easy. I just yeah, need Brian to stop making any money. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that's not going to happen, Tom. I'm going to continue to print these dollars forever, and you can't stop me. I don't know. Scott Johnson's got Le Miz. But Le Miz I, is going to make $20 million, dude. Yeah, Le Miz I don't think is not he could even catch nothing. you with that, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. All it's, right. it's you and me. This is great, man. How often have we ever I know, had a we've, race? I don't think we've ever come right down, down head to head uh, at the yeah. very end. Let's uh, take a look at what we're watching. What we're watching. Now, we're both watching Walking Dead, obviously, but Brian, are, are you going to give up on watching the TV show? You're pretty darn into the video game. Dude, I, I full on cried. And uh, and it's the first video game that does it. I have said publicly that uh, that it's easy to make video games make you scared. It's easy to make uh, video games make you angry. And that's why, uh, because those emotions are so easy to evoke, that's where the early days, I mean, as far back as 20 years ago, I remember being, you know, scared out of my pants watching or and playing Doom. But but. If you want to be taken seriously as an art form, you got to make somebody cry. And that's what The Walking Dead did. It was amazing and brutal. The Walking and adorable. Dead video game. Walking Dead video game was incredible. And, and I, I, of course, you know, we're, we're frame rate primarily about the moving pictures. But I'm telling you, the, the experience of playing the video game was as powerful as reading the comic book and in so many ways even better certainly better than the entire second season of the walking dead wow. uh, it was yeah. it was amazing and i highly encourage everyone to do it i think it's half price right now on steam if you guys want to pick that up have you played it jeff oh yes it's fantastic i agree did you i haven't, I haven't, I haven't played the last episode yet but I haven't played oh, you, the last you, episode. You haven't played the no. episode? Okay, all right. Well, no. I, I'm certainly no spoilers, but uh, but it was it was amazing. Uh, I also, um, Bonnie and I sat in on Friday night and tried to have like a, a movie night in. So we just surfed around on Netflix, finding properties that we had heard of and that we had wanted to watch. Uh, I watched the beginning of Tim and Eric's Billion Dollar Movie, which I thought was hilarious. But then there was too much dong humor and then Bonnie lost interest. Uh, and then, uh, like so your marriage. I, I, I still have to go back and watch the rest of it, but, uh, but I also watched the first episode of Archer, which I definitely have enjoyed. I'm going to dive in and watch the rest of Archer. H John Benjamin just has the best voice on planet earth. Oh yeah. No, I, you know what? I watched the first episode of Archer. Was it this past week? Uh, on Netflix myself. Uh, and it Did was, you? yeah, yeah. Uh, Eileen yeah. didn't, she was like, eh. It that's what that's what Bonnie was. Bonnie was just like, ah, and I was just like, are you kidding me? This is hilarious. Know, but again, right? too yeah. much dong humor for Made the ladies. Me. Yeah, it's quite a bit of dong humor there, too. <laughs> uh, I watched Battlestar Galactica Blood and Chrome all the way up to episodes five and six, which were, were the last ones, the latest ones released. Uh, and I know it's coming to TV in 2013, so I, I, I'm not going to lament that it's not going to be coming to TV, but it really has the promise to have been a great television series. At least I think so. And the criticisms I've seen are, well, but we know how it ends. Like, where's the tension? You know, we, we know where it's going. Uh, anybody who's watched Battlestar Galactica itself, the, you know, the, the re reboot, uh, know, knows from the beginning episode what's going to happen at the end of Blood and Chrome. But I still, it's, it's all about the journey. It's all about getting there. Uh, the effects are great. Uh, the characterization seems strong. Uh, the script, I don't know if it's because it's broken up. Sometimes feels a little jumpy to me, but it may be the fact that I'm watching it in 17 minute chunks uh, instead of all as a piece. Have, you, have either of you guys watched it yet? No, I still haven't. It's no. it's it's definitely worth it, and and you can chew through four episodes like that. I mean, just I was watching them on my iPad. How, how long is each episode? They they range from anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, somewhere in there. All right, somewhere in that range. Uh, also, uh, watching, still watching Haven again. I think. Most underrated show on television, uh, and and finishing up with Fringe, uh, Jeff. I've heard you say that about Haven before. I gotta get on that. I gotta check that. Is it on Netflix or yeah, where can I see uh, that? Where I do I think I think you can get the earlier seasons on on Netflix. I know iTunes has it as well. Uh, if you're, you're willing to shell out for it, um, mm. and and Amazon Video on Demand. It's just uh, and it's been getting better all the time too. So I don't know. Maybe part of me just wants to live in New England in a Stephen King <laughs> novel. I don't. <laughs> Uh, you but you went and uh, and saw Life of Pi, Jeff. How yes. was that? Uh, it, I think it's one of the best movies of the year, and it is a true work of art that is commercial and high adventure, entertaining, and also poignant, and it'll learn you something. And it is one of the most visually spectacular films 
I've ever seen. Uh, I would recommend seeing it in 3D on a gigantic screen and get lost in the visuals. It is an incredible movie, and everybody should go see it. I really want it to do well, and I'm afraid it will not. And it's it's one of those risky movies that studios just don't make anymore, and it's sad to see people not support it. I think it's now, an how, incredible how much experience. Of, how- how much of your skepticism is based on the fact that, like, Cloud Atlas essentially took a yeah. dump at the box office? Same Z's. Same Z's. Uh, you know, I, I liked Cloud Atlas a lot, too. I, I don't think Cloud Atlas is nearly the movie that Life of Pi is, um, but I, I enjoyed Cloud Atlas quite a bit. And it's sad to see that risky, strange, doesn't fit in a box kind of experience um, and, and expensive as well. I mean, Life of Pi and Cloud Atlas are, are both very expensive movies for, for how risky they are. And, um, you know, the, these studios just aren't going to make those take those kinds of risks if those movies can tank over and over. Yeah. Um, did you read so, the book? I did. I did. Uh, I read the book years ago, and it was one of those books where I immediately, like, bought copies from my sister and my mom and, like, handed it to people and said, you have to read this, you have to read this. Nice. And it was one of those, you know, unfilmable books. And the fact that he... Put it on screen. It's very faithful. It, it it conveys all the same esoteric emotions, but does so in such a an accessible, commercial, spectacular manner. It, it is really an amazing achievement. Yeah, and and then uh, you saw another movie uh, last night. I put up the tree behind me. Yeah, uh, and and uh, the girlfriend and I watched uh, what is for my money might be my favorite Christmas movie ever. Love Actually. Love is your favorite Christmas movie ever. It might be. Wow. It might be. It's it's up there. I, I'd have to. Th- I mean, a Christmas Story, of course, has a special place in my sure. heart. But Miracle Love on Thirty Fourth Street, just, Wonderful Life, Scrooge. Oh, it's wonderful Life is I amazing. I can't. Too. It's, it's like yeah. part of me just wants to immediately do all the hack bits and make fun of you. But it's like I've never seen Love Actually, so I, I you haven't can't. seen it, Brian. Oh nope, my god. Nope, 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 nope. I, Sit down I with people, your wife and watch it. It's amazing. I, I think all it's right. a fantastic movie, Brian. Uh, and and I. Uh, the people I know and respect disagree with me viciously about that. They Some people really? think it's a, tr- a piece of crap. Uh, I haven't heard that. Wow. I, I have heard that from a couple people, but I'll, I'll defend it. I, you know, it is a romantic comedy about love, unapologetically. But I think it's well woven, and it's got great actors in it. Can, it, can, really I, can I tell you, I feel the same way about uh, Sliding Doors, the Gwyneth Paltrow movie. Oh, that's a great, I love Sliding Doors. Days. Yeah, no, it's got, it's got alternate realities in it. Yeah, cool. yeah, it's got a little <laughs> yeah, sci-fi, sci-fi twist in there. A little there. spice yeah. of sci-fi in there. All right, let's finish up with some feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Radio, yeah. Sean writes into FRTwit.tv, says, I wanted to share a quick story with you guys. My girlfriend and I decided to go see Argo on Saturday night, even though Tom spoiled the ending. Then he says he's just trolling me, uh, that he actually agrees with me on that one. Uh, He said, we drive to the theater, buy our tickets, get our popcorn, grab our seats. Movie's supposed to start at 7.10. 7.25 rolls around, and we're still staring at the graphics that come before the previews. The manager comes out and tells us that they had just installed new security software that protects their projector against hackers who want to pirate the movie, and the software (coughs) made the projector freeze. They had to reboot it to see if they could get it working again. In the meantime, they handed out a free movie ticket to everyone in the theater. Fifteen minutes later, he walks out again, says the projector is now broken, and we will not be able to see the movie. They gave us another free movie ticket. And while we were compensated appropriately, there was a theater full of people who legally paid to see a film that they couldn't because the theaters were protecting themselves against hackers who want to pirate. Just seemed ridiculous to me, especially because I could walk out of the theater and still torrent that film without any problem. I didn't, but this is another example of consumers trying to pay legitimately and suffering. You know what? We should do a whole show about exactly this kind of problem, Tom. You and me. We should call it Rate the Frames with Tom we and call Brian. call it Rame Freight. There you go. Where we, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. The, we also got an email from uh, regarding, remember I showed you really quickly that uh, that laser uh, done projector that was like 40,000 lumens or something ridiculous in order to make it bright enough to look good for uh, for uh 3d viewing mm-hmm. and uh we got an email from one of the guys actually working with them um hold on here we go christy digital is working on a laser best light source uh let me tell you if you've seen 3d presentation on a sony i can see why you're bullish on 3d uh it requires a lot of light he points out uh, he says they use dlp um i forget exactly 
why I put this on there. Oh, here we go. Barco is also working on a similar light source setup, and Sony seemed to be pretty much uh, giving up on digital cinema and leaving it to the pros. Keep up the great work. But uh, it was just, if you go back and take a look at the footage we got uh, of that ridiculously bright projector designed for 3D stuff, uh, it's very, very cool. Whenever we talk about advertising on the show, Derek Chen is always kind enough to write in and give us some insight. Uh, and he said, in reference to your discussion on print and online advertising, eMarketer actually published a forecast this year on how online advertising has overtaken print advertising in the U.S. He says, even in my own experience, budget for print advertising has certainly dropped drastically every year. In fact, several print publications in the past few years have ceased production. At this point, online advertising has risen to become second in advertising media spend, television still has a clear lead when it comes to the proportion of an ad spend. In fact, it continues to grow, albeit at a low rate. But most studies have shown that online's growth has really been at the expense of print and other media channels. He goes on with a lot of great information in here. Uh, but for those who are rooting for the money to get to online so we can make those higher quality uh, pieces that we were talking about earlier, uh, this, this is kind of where it stands. TV's kind of leading the pace uh, and 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 right now online is eating prints lunch, so that that's going to have to level out before online starts to steal from TV or merge with TV, which is I, I think is is more likely to happen. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, and we also got one more email from a fan of the original House of Cards. Uh, he confessed not to have seen last week's episode, wherein you and I, of course, watched the trailer that was released for House of Cards here in America and just drooled all over it. But uh, his enthusiasm was totally palpable. That was trusty. Thank you for sending that in. And, of course, we want to remind everybody, if you send us emails, send them to fr at twit.tv. If we don't respond to it, it's because we threw it in the dock and plan to respond to it on the show. So if we don't respond and it's not on the show, it's because we ran out of time. But we didn't run out of time this time. No, we did not. Uh, Jeff Kanata, uh, on on what has got to be a, a pretty crazy day f for you uh, today, I really appreciate you being a guest on Frame Rate. Oh, it's my pleasure, guys. So much fun. I, I had a blast. Thank you. For those who don't know, uh, Jeff hosted a fantastic show for years uh, along with Alex Albrecht and Danny, Danny Trachtenberg called Totally Rad Show. Uh, and 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 today is the end of a, of an era in in online video uh, with with the last of those shows. No oh, thanks. Yeah, that last one came out this morning. So Did, well, I and, and we we were talking about we were reminiscing before the show started, and uh, I want to say it again for everybody watching or listening to the show after the fact. Uh, the Totally Rad Show was the show that made me fall in love with Revision 3. It was the show that that made me feel like I wanted so much to be a part of what is happening in new media. And to this very day, it's it's one of my favorite, all-time favorite. Like, you have no idea. I don't think I ever even told you this. Uh, my assistant at the time sent in a question to you guys asking if all three of you were left-handed because he's this guy <laughs> who always notices that everyone's, you know, whether somebody uses their right hand or left hand. And he noticed all three of you were left-handed. And we were on a plane to uh to istanbul at the time while we were watching the show together and then your question came up and or you know his question came up and it was like holy cow look and like in that moment i was awestruck because my assistant had sent in a question that was being read by the totally rod show guys and so <laughs> it, it, you guys have reached a level of fan uh interaction and commitment that uh, that I stand in awe of, and that I think is the model by which all other new media uh, shows should be judged. Well, you're too kind. I, I, I appreciate it very much. And, and the best part of, of doing the show has been the fact that I've made so many incredible new friends and gotten to hang out with so many incredible people over the, over the few years, not the least of which are you two guys. So I, you know, if it wasn't for the Totally Rad Show, I wouldn't be here doing this right now. And I, I value... All the people I've been able to meet, all the all the fans who've written in this week has been incredible, and and uh, it's a very very special special day and and the best six years of my life. Well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, appreciate you doing it. Uh, frame rate as always. You're welcome back anytime. Open, thanks a lot. Open door policy. Uh, and and let's enough looking backwards. That's actually a positive for internet video is that we have a history. Of shows, yeah. I, I I've got plenty of canceled yes, shows in my do. background as well. Uh, yes, you so, do. So looking forward, uh, you're contributing to Always On. Any any other projects you want to talk about? Um, I I don't have anything at the moment. Hopefully, uh, there'll be stuff coming up soon. I'm definitely you're, you're still doing for Weekend Confirmed, right? You're still doing still doing Weekend, weekend Confirmed. Yeah, yeah, which is an audio show on Shack News, um, all about video games. 
And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for my next gig. So hopefully something comes soon. And uh, if you follow me on Twitter at Jeff Canada with two N's and one T, you'll be the first to know. Excellent. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. Uh, we are live every Monday at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time at live.twit.tv. You can find all of our episodes. Uh, if for some reason you want to go back and dig up things we said to hold against us at twit.tv slash fr. And, of course, you can email us framerate at twit.tv or fr at twit.tv. Either one of those works. Uh, we will see you next time. So, my young apprentice. That was weird. Wait, that was weird. Um, I mean, both things were weird. Why was I saying that? Also, <laughs> it was like a commentary on I, your introduction. He's like, that's weird. It's, it's, what I'd love to do is the entire show where, where <laughs> Jason just second guesses all of our moves as hosts. He's just like, really? I don't think that's that? right, Tom. Um, I didn't think, uh, that wasn't very weird. insightful, Brian. Yeah. Well, all right, all right. But if that's what you Oh, you'll say. totally enjoy that episode when I do that. <laughs> the, the 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 howl commentary right. versions. Okay, look, uh this is this episode was brilliantic <laughs> because the parts that were good were so good. It reminded me of why I capital L O V E this show. Like uh, you know, Rooker stole every scene that he was in. We finally saw Rooker in his element. The, the torture scene was amazing. I believed it and I got sucked in. And all of a sudden it was hard for me to remember what was driving me nuts beforehand. Uh, that whole experiment with convincing that one guy that they really do come back as monsters uh, with, with, you know, the whole figuring out what happens when you die. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't hate Andrea during this episode. I actually kind of dug everything she did. There was a lot to love about this. However, there were two scenes that were stupid. They were stupid and they dropped the ball and they had no reason to exist. Number one was that whole scene where they run across the one guy who lives with a dead dog and somehow hmm. missed the How, fact that yeah, the world No, ended. I, I'm 100% with you there. And I, I don't yeah. mean to interrupt for your two things, but I just like th that. I thought, oh, okay, where's this going? Who's this going to be? What? It, no, no, no reason. <laughs> he was well, purely I, a vehicle for them to escape. Well, yes. Yeah, End of story. Was I missing something? Other? You're right. I think that's the only purpose mm -hmm. he served. Because it made no. Oh, I just sat in here with my dead dog and and free. I don't realize the cops don't exist. Like it just didn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, at it was all. weird. It, it really did. It was. It was just. Um, and again, uh, that that seems to me like maybe somebody had set something up in the writers' room and it just didn't translate. It didn't make it happen. Uh, I, I I don't know what happened, but that entire scene was such a dead end, and it's too bad because outside of that. I really dug watching them come together saying, we're going to rescue our guys. We're going to take them out. Uh, and even Michonne's, uh, uh, you know, M Michonne's cool analysis of the prison gang of of seeing like like I loved that moment where uh, there was a moment of brilliant acting when Carol sees the baby and gets excited and then looks at Rick, reads Rick's reaction, instantly knows that Lori died like mm -hmm. nothing is spoken. No words spoken, like, right? But so much said. Uh, it was that is the writers trusting their actors, and that's hard to do, and and that that deserves high praise, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. However, there was one other very stupid moment in that uh, they had a they had an opportunity. They paid ninety five percent of the price with the viewers. There there was an opportunity to make the governor a bad guy. And they went ahead and they paid us. They tortured the audience by making us watch this this molestation, uh, you know, pre-rape ritual where where he had her take off her, her clothes or whatever. And then they got right to the end. And then for for no reason whatsoever, they decided to back off and have him, you know, walk, shrug his shoulders and walk out. What was that about? It did, it was disconnected again. And 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 look, people are making some good points about what could have been done in the barn. To make it make sense, because it was about them learning to trust Michonne. And all the things you guys are saying are true in the chat room. It's that the character just didn't play. Uh, and I felt the same way here. Like like you're saying, Brian, like, you know, like a really disturbing scene could be set up here. I was puzzled at the beginning and at the end. At the yeah. when, he, when, he, when he suddenly, uh, like, abruptly said, 
oh, I'm going to be a gentleman and ask if I can sit down and like, oh, now I'm going to ask you to take your shirt off. I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't I don't believe that right turn. My right, right turns are not a problem, but I just did not believe that 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 happened. But it's like, OK, once I put that behind me, maybe maybe he is like, you know, we're going to finally see the true evil behind him that has been hidden from Andrea and from all the people of the town. And, and like you said, it was all like, well, that was my gambit, but I guess it didn't work. And <laughs> Whatever. And, and, and if anything, it was meant to get her in that state so he could drag her in in front of Glenn. And that part played, right? Right. Glenn was well, bothered because he saw her being humiliated. She was bothered because she saw the state that Glenn was in. That whole scene is self-contained. It didn't hardly even need the other scene because the other scene didn't contribute to anything. Yeah, correct, correct. And uh, although I will say that it was a good twist to have the governor say the exact same words in the exact same way and have it read as completely creepy with Maggie, but completely, uh, you know, touching with with uh, Andrea. Mm. Like, like I, I see what they were trying to go with that, but it didn't fit when he did it with with Maggie, especially after he chickened out. Like, I didn't believe him. I didn't believe him. If he, you know, he put well, his and pants back on saying, and walked out. People in the chat room are saying, well, they couldn't show him doing that to Maggie. Yeah, okay. You don't all have they to had show to do, it. All they had to do was end that scene 10 seconds earlier. They went out of their way to announce that he did not rape Maggie. Everything up until that point, if they had in the middle of that had him walk around and then just boom, cut to black, we all know what would have happened. Yeah, and, we, and, and, and in fact, that's thought. almost worse because it's like, well, maybe nothing happened. Maybe uh, we don't know. Uh, right. And so that leaves a lot of unresolved tension. Well, uh, and it certainly would have changed the context. Like when he's creepily hugging on her in front of Glenn, it would have told us everything we would have known. It's it's as though mm. it, it felt to me like somebody added something last minute because some uh, standards and practices person chickened out at the last minute and the show definitely suffered for it and the character certainly suffered for it uh they they this is not a case where they didn't go the extra mile Th this is a case where they went the extra mile to neuter what otherwise could have been a horrific and and deeply disturbing and and profound moment in television and i i I actually, some of the points you've been making about why you dislike the governor, I'm becoming more comfortable with him in this episode because, and I thought about it right when he did that thing where he asked, do you mind if I sit down? That part was brilliant because it's like, okay, this is who this guy is, right? He is the disingenuous, polite man. He is right. he's the guy who thinks that courtesy covers intentions. So I don't care if I've got you tied up. Uh, you know, or, or even if I just cut your bonds and, I, and I've got you a prisoner against your will, I'm going to follow the forms and then everything will be OK. And then they undermine it right away with this with this weird turn. It would have been creepier if he if he didn't ask her to take her shirt off and just tried to be, you know, affectionate with her in some some even creepier, like semi polite way. Uh, but he went base and it didn't fit with the governor yes. that they have built up so far. Yeah. Well, and now having said all that, like the problems I got, the, the, the stupid stuff in the show are, is what was stupid enough that it really pushed me out of it. However, the rest of it uh, was uh, overall, this episode was definitely a win. It certainly pulled me farther in on the story. Uh, but uh, but man, those stupid parts were way stupid. No, you're right about that. And, and, and in, in, all, in all defense, we're, we're over concentrating on the bad parts because this show was good. This episode was, was good. And the Glenn bit was genius. Yes. Uh, it was believable. It was believable for Glenn uh, Rooker's, uh, or I'm sorry, Merle's. Uh, no, he's Rooker. Uh, yeah, he's, I know. he's a Rooker. You could say But Merle's breakdown of Glenn's character was just brilliant. Uh, that that whole string, that whole plot line, was just fabulous. And and Glenn's my favorite character from the book. I don't know if he's my favorite character on the show or not, but I definitely root for him. So seeing him like finally take down that that zombie and then get the respect from the guys who are like, well, you took that thing apart. Like you must have learned something out on the road. That that was awesome. What? And and it was good too because it's like uh, I I believed that he was an asset where. I believe when Rooker closed that door, he genuinely didn't care if he lived or died. It was just like, well, if he died, then we got more leverage with the lady. If yeah. he lives, then, you know, we got more leverage with the lady. It's like it doesn't matter. And accidents I, I, happen. Yes, exactly. I do have one very petty thing. Hold on. I got I got a visual aid for this. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how this happened, but I, I was so disturbed by it. I took a photo of my screen. Did you notice... The totally bent ass guns that this guy was, was toting around. No, I didn't. See, I didn't on notice the wall. that. 
<laughs> like I, 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 I don't know if that's a weird optical illusion that I was the only one who's seeing. But the moment I saw that, I was like, "Wait, really?" It's like it was very unfortunate. What's well, for shooting around corners? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, Dude, it's actually specifically for shooting around plot holes. I'm told. <laughs> no, I didn't see that. That's weird. That's almost yeah. a Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, it does. It looks like that. It just needs to turn a little towards the camera. That's amazing. But, uh, but good episode in general. And if you're not watching the show, you definitely should be. And in fact, I'm going to say If you're not watching point, the show, what are you doing watching the spoiler zone? Yes, exactly. You're a silly person. But <laughs> I'm going to say that this, uh, you really could just start the show at the beginning of the third season. And in fact, I almost would recommend everyone do that. I would, Don't watch, even I would watch the first three episodes still. Yeah. Easily. The first episode sure. was amazing. The pilot episode was fantastic. It was, uh, it was it was way good, but but by no means like I think the third season stands on its own. I sure, think that, no, I, uh, I know what you're saying, but I feel like you'd be missing out if you didn't see that how it all started episode that with him waking up in the hospital and everything. Yes, agreed, agreed. Yeah. All right, uh, that's it for the spoiler zone. Thanks everybody for hanging around a little extra time, and we will see you next week. Really humbling, just the amount of people that have uh, sent such incredibly kind things and, and I mean, page-long emails and tweets and uh, just the outpouring of, of really genuine feeling has is, is been uh, pretty special. And uh, I know that, I mean, I hope that, that bigger and better is in my future and, and that, you know, there's more success to come, but... I will be surprised if there's anything that I do that that connects with people in the same way that the show has. And I I know I really value it and uh, it's very precious to all of us. And, and we're we're all feel very lucky to have to have been a part of it. I'll, I'll tell you what, you guys were also in a weird spot in that everybody and, and I mean this in sincerely the best way possible. You You guys all knew there was kind of a ticking time bomb in that like like. You guys had so much talent and success, you know, written all three of you, you know, like we want, uh, you know, Danny to be busy with a major motion, motion picture. We want you to all of a sudden be on a sitcom that we all see. So it's like weirdly we were all cheering for all three of you guys to have some kind of gig that suddenly made it impossible to do Totally Rad Show. Uh, and, and to some degree, obviously, that's happened because you guys are all busy doing other things. But uh, it, it makes it all the more bittersweet for the viewing audience that that wants the best for you guys and part of the best means moving beyond your awesome internet show well it's nice of you to say i you know i think there there are a lot of shows obviously about uh movies video games comic books tv shows um but i always said and i and i think it's honestly true that our show was about a friendship and it happened to be a friendship filtered through those topics but first and foremost it was about the three of us being buddies. And, uh, I think that people connected to that and, uh, I hope, and it, it, it seems to be the case from all the feedback that we've gotten, especially these last two weeks that it felt like hanging out with, uh, three friends, you know, f for those episodes. And, uh, and that's really special and I, and I'm, I treasure it. So that's, yeah, that's definitely the way buzz out loud always felt. Uh, yeah. and, and so I, I, I get the flavor of, of what you're talking about. Uh, I mean, I, I ditched it before it was over, so it's... Not exactly <laughs> exactly. Um, but Belmont started that. It wasn't my idea. Uh, but no, I, I know what you mean, because that show felt, you know, at, 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 at all, the, all the way through, that it, like just friends, at its best anyway, friends just hanging out and, and, and chatting. And that's, that, that's what Brian and I just can't seem to capture with Frame Rate. Right. No, well, that's dude, that's the problem. Is yeah, no, we're soulless and dead yeah. inside, and that's the reason we have you. You are meant to be the heart. It's like we already got the 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 mind. Tom Merritt is is Bill Murray. Like I'm I'm Ray Stance, uh, but like you know we need a uh, wait. Hold on, which one is the heart? There is no heart. That was the mind, the mouth, and the hands. Ladies and gentlemen, the heart and soul of the Ghostbusters. Yes, exactly. <laughs>